live. Hi, Bill Douglas here, Gotham Communications. Happy to be moderating this panel at uh, the Harassus USA conference. The title of the panel is Changing the Nature of Wall Street's, Wall Street's Premise. I'm pleased to be joined today uh, by Scott Friedheim, Managing Partner of Friedheim Capital, and Brett Hickey, Founder and CEO of Star Mountain Capital. And there may be a couple other panelists who are able to join us uh, uh, midstream. But uh, happy to uh, have this uh, illustrious panel and look forward to, uh, to, to speaking with both of you. Um, our session is being recorded, so it'll be viewable later um, on YouTube and so forth if, uh, you know, if not as many people are able to, uh, to join us live. Um, Scott, Brett, if you don't mind, maybe you'd like to uh, introduce yourselves and, uh, and, and you know, say a few words about your background. Starting just uh, with, with Scott. Uh, Scott Friedheim, uh, Friedheim Capital. My background was 18 years on Wall Street, um, Chief Operating Officer of Sears Holdings, CEO Europe for InvestCore. Uh, I'm an investor and in Thank you, Scott. And, uh, and, and, and welcome, Michael. Uh, Michael, we were just making some introductory remarks in, uh, in alphabetical order, so maybe we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to you next. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Appreciate that, Bill. Uh, glad to be with you. So Michael Burns, uh, I'm a partner with Murray Hill Group, a pri private investment firm, uh, technology focused. And uh, I am uh, uh, both, uh, I'm a recovered entrepreneur. So I've done five venture backed companies, uh, semiconductor software and related, uh, including a gear uh, sequence semiconductor, traffic.com and, and uh, an ideal semiconductor. And then I um, spent time at uh, TL Ventures, Guggenheim Partners, uh, and Alera Capital on the uh, early stage, mid-stage uh, tech investment side. Happy to be here. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, back Michael. Brett? Hi, Brett Hickey, founder and CEO of Starmount Capital. We are a specialized lower middle market private investment firm. We have uh, three complementary strategies of private credit secondary fund investing in both structured and controlled private equity, uh, manage approximately two and a half billion dollars and have um, approximately a hundred person team, including 40 operating partners in 20 cities across the US. Excellent, well, thank you all for, uh, for, for joining me here. And if I could, you know, I'll just um, kind of review the, the topic at hand here. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the, the title of our talk is Changing the Nature of Wall Street's Premise. All stock markets, not just Wall Street, wish to maximize profits, but their aim is not perceived as responsible by investors who wish to balance short vis-a-vis -vis long term. Uh, will taxing, then it, it poses a few questions. Will taxing carbon emissions force firms into decent behavior? Will governments be willing to set a high bar on this taxation? And what other fiscal changes will be of benefit to the planet? Uh, so, you know, clearly there are a variety of, uh, of, of, of factors at work here and a, a lot of sort of uh, interrelated uh, subtopics that, uh, that can be explored. Um, Brett, you know, when we spoke before, you had mentioned one factor that, that, that may play uh, a role here is, uh, is aging demographics. Would you want to kind of unpack that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Well, one of the things, Bill, that I would say is systematic around changing the way people think is... We are far more aware as a society, more information, more data, and therefore with that more desire, I think systematically uh, across the globe for people to have less of a negative impact and have more of a positive impact. And so when you think about that dynamic, businesses that are established, small, medium sized businesses, which is referred to as the lower middle market, has a lot of aging demographic business owners and newer owners starting companies and taking over those existing businesses that really apply today's framework to these companies, looking to make them better for the environment, having stronger ESG, looking to really be purpose driven. If you want to attract and retain today's top talent, uh, that top talent is really focused on these high quality uh, businesses where they think they can make an impact no longer as it was when you know, I, I was, um, you know, in college in the late 90s studying finance and we were excited to work for hedge funds, big investment banks and so forth. 
Now, where I sit on the global board of Harvard's alumni entrepreneurs, for example, what the students coming out of undergraduate school are looking to do is less go work for large financial institutions and more work for companies where they feel they have an aligned purpose and mission and can make an impact. And don't get me wrong, they're still financially motivated, but they want to be able to have it all. They want financial motivation, they want purpose, and they want impact. And I think that's great because that is really the current swell. And one of the things that Star Mountain loves about the lower middle market is that's who we get to invest with, that's who we get to engage with. And we think that by assisting these people in driving success, they are systematically applying today's focus and today's lens on the world of finance and business. Yeah, that's really interesting because I tended to think of uh, of the pull of um, uh, of this movement toward ESG, social responsibility, um, impact investing, and and, and related um, um, strategies. You know, as coming from from the investment side, that uh, that investors and alligators allocators are are more and more keen on these issues and uh, kind of, um, um, you know, making them sometimes a prerequisite for investment. But in your experience, you know, the pool you're really feeling more is from uh, is from on the HR side, wanting to get top top talent that is coming out of, of B school, uh, feeling really motivated on these on these topics. huh? Yeah, I think it's actually both, Bill. You're 100 percent right. And I think it's very positive that the larger institutional investors, and as Bill would probably know, Europe has been ahead of this relative to the U.S. Um, systematically. Historically speaking, I think the U.S., Canada, and other markets are very actively catching up and focused on ways to drive impact. But I would say that almost all institutional investors now want to understand how you are applying ESG frameworks to your business and to the companies you're evaluating uh, and the businesses you're investing in. And so that's a very positive driver and trend as well. When I started Star Mountain 13 years ago, for example, the trends were pretty clear to me and we've been fortunate to be an award-winning culture many years in a row. And a big part of that is by being able to attract and really provide the type of environment that today's very you know driven talent and some of the younger talent wants and what they're seeking. And that's just harder for the big battleships to move and change cultures even though they are trying and some of them will be successful in doing it. But it's actually, it's, it's two ways. What you hear about in the press is more what the bigger institutional investors are driving. But if you look at where the younger generation is going, where they want to work, what they're doing, it's actually, those trends are very clear. And in fact, on wall street, you've seen what that has resulted in is them having to pay up. Uh, Goldman Sachs, you know, last year made a, a front page of Wall Street Journal announcement that they're increasing pay by 30%. And not because they don't want to uh, help people more, but let's be clear as to what's driving the desire to increase pay dramatically and systematically, because a struggle to access talent, nothing to do with Goldman Sachs is a great institution, just to do with finance in general, because talent is looking at a whole bunch of things, not just finance as a career, whereas historically, the financial industry really used to be able to be a, a really clear top choice for a lot of students. And um, now they have to think more competitively, not just about the economic opportunity, but the purpose behind the institutions to attract and retain uh, what I'll call today's modern outlook. Great. Yeah. Um, Mike, Scott, any, any comment or thoughts on, uh, on where this, um, where this pull toward uh, more, you know, environmental and social responsibility is 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 coming from. Any, anything you want to share from your experience or any observations? Uh, sure, I'll jump in. Um, I think it's both. I think there is a war for talent. Um, uh, that being and I think the shift in terms of behaviors, um, the the generation that's coming out of school now cares more about the environment, um, more about uh, work-life balance, more about uh, philanthropy than the, the generations that preceded them. And that is making them a more mobile workforce and it's increasing the bar for talent. That being said, when you look at the percent of uh, people who graduate from the top Ivy League schools, Wall Street uh, finance broadly is still the leader. Um, when, when, you talk about 
um, the panel and the premise of the panel, changing the nature of uh, Wall Street, um, I think you start with the premise that we live in a uh, a society that uh, is one that has adopted capitalism, free markets. And I think it's uh, pretty efficient and it has driven the highest standard of living anywhere in the world. Capital flows freely to the best risk-adjusted returns. There are lots of asset classes that contribute to diversification across asset classes. Um, led in the, uh, at the onset talking about ESG and um, uh, as you pointed out, there, there, there's an increasing debate which is at the front end of it, which is sort of shareholder versus stakeholder. And Larry Fink uh, famously came out and now there's a truck uh, running around <laughs> New York City protesting him. Um, but big picture, um, if we're going to try to make inroads, uh, I, 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 would, I wouldn't narrow the focus to, say, carbon tax credits. Rather, I'd start with the premise that there's well over $50 trillion of asset center management in the U.S., and that money is looking for the best returns because if someone doesn't deliver, deliver returns, then they're going to be out of business and the capital markets will flow to whoever does deliver returns. And they in turn look for the companies that are delivering the best. In the United States, the top private equity firms, say the top 25, just those alone raised a trillion dollars in the past five years. 18 of those are American. So there's a lot of capital there looking to be put to work. In venture, last year they raised $100 billion um, and invested $70 billion last year alone. So uh, investors want to invest in ESG. In fact, they promote and they celebrate it. Um, and was just pointed out, um, BlackRock, one of the biggest institutions with a little over $9 trillion of asset center management, made it part of their assessment framework. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to be throwing money at it and having it as be a lost leader. That being said, they really want to invest here. Um, and then you have the government. The government has a multi-trillion dollar budget. They have lots of levers. Um, but I don't think there's been a convergence of government with the investment community to the degree that we need. So on climate change alone, um, you have a number of programs. You have R&D grants. You have small uh, business investment research, um, an advanced technology program. Uh, yes, the, the carbon tax credits and loan guarantees. Um, but I don't think they're working closely enough because uh, when you look at government industry partnerships, it's typically populated, whether it's the committees, the staff or the sponsors, government and academics. And there are people from industry, large corporate America, because the funds predominantly are going to R&D below the venture layer. Uh, but I think we can better engage that large pool of asset assets under management by engaging the investment community to figure out what are the levers that move the needle the most. And I'd like to see much better integration from government and the investment community on that, because right now it's largely been a political debate, revolution versus evolution. And if there's one thing in, um, uh, in uh, current topics that has given a lot of people in investment community pause as it relates to this, it's Russia and the Ukraine and how Western Europe has really throttled back on any development of um, carbon-related energy. And uh, whether that was the factor or a contributing factor, uh, Putin certainly feels like he's got the leverage geopolitically to do what he wants in Ukraine <clears throat> because he hold, he's holding people, um, uh, he's holding this leverage over them. So um, I think two things, capitalism is the bedrock. And I think to the extent that uh, there are things that we can do that make the world a better place, I think we should engage with the investment community to figure out how we allocate public resources more effectively to incent them to make those investments. You're on a mute, Bill. Uh, still, Bill.
maybe Michael, you can take a crack at your yeah, thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll welcome myself. Yeah, I, Scott, I, 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 I agree with you. I think that uh, there, the capitalism is the bedrock, and there is clearly a need for better alignment uh, with government. And I think that something dramatic happened in the last two years. Now, obviously, I'm I'm an investor who spends a lot of time in semiconductors and around that market. But I think that's been the canary in the coal mine, right? This was the first time, uh, and, and some of us were involved in D.C., which we normally don't do, right? This is the first time that a couple of trends have pushed uh, for a discussion in D.C. around things like industrial policy. And so I think for, for decades, industrial policy was a third rail of politics, right? No one would touch it. No Republican, no Democrat, no independent. You know, we, we do not tell the private sector what to do. We don't pick winners and, and we don't provide uh, overarching incentives because it's not the American way. I think the uh, the recognition of a rising China and and uh, and some of the other policies in Asia that are very heavily focused on industrial policy change competitive dynamics in a number of markets. And then capitalism was left maybe some of its worst features, right? Which is the the uh, the intent to pursue profit at all at all cost, which uh, of course uh, is is a, something that makes it very efficient. Uh, but in many situations, you can make a, a short-term uh, capitalistic trade-off that really is damaging long-term. And long-term could mean long-term to the planet. It could also just be long-term to economic security of the Western democracies in the world. And so uh, one thing we do at Murray Hill, for example, is we, we take all of our investments and we filter through a lens of uh, whether or not this is good for the uh, economic security of Western democracies. And, 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 and part of that, of course, is climate change. But there are many other aspects of it that are very real, and, and I think we're seeing those come into play. So uh, what we saw about uh, 18 months ago now, or 12 months ago, uh, was the passage of the CHIPS Act. So now you saw for the first time $52 billion allocated by Congress in a, in a bipartisan manner. Uh, of all things, it was attached to the NDAA, the National uh, Defense Authorization Act. Um, and, and of course, there's always a bit of bureaucracy and we're still waiting to see it uh, appropriated. <laughs> but, uh, but nuances aside, it showed a willingness to, for government to align itself with industry and ask, what is wrong? Why does America not have semiconductor foundries? Why is everything gated through factories in Taiwan and China? And what can we do to change that? And in a, in a business where your cost of goods sold might be as high as 50 or 60 percent uh, up for capital expenditure amortized over time, those upfront subsidies for capital expenditures make a huge competitive long-term difference. So I think that that's an example. And I think we're going to see that kind of action with climate change, but also now in, in, a, in a post Afghanistan, Ukrainian COVID world, I think we recognize a lot of other risks and a lot of other dynamics that, uh, that need the alignment of private sector, Wall Street and the government. No, no luck still, Bill. Maybe if we want, we'll just we'll just kind of keep uh, going going around. Uh, I guess if that if that makes sense, uh, let's let's assume Bill, Bill would nudge us in that direction. Uh, anyways, um, I guess from from maybe my perspective at, at Star Mountain Capital, one of the things that I always like to talk about is there's challenges, and as we know, life is easy to talk about them. Maybe what are what are each of us, you know, Scott and Michael, seeing as opportunities to help you know, improve different situations? Uh, one of them, I think, that we see within Star Mountain's business model in particular, one of our investment areas we call it value-added lending, where we're lending to established privately owned businesses that are great operators that have great companies, but are looking to take their businesses to the next level and never have before. Often, that's making acquisitions. That's building a professional institutional board of directors, uh, building a deeper second management layer underneath them. And what we found is that there's a lot of companies that really want that value. They want to build diverse boards. They want to build better governance as we think about ESG, for example, but they don't really know how, right? They're like, yes, I'd love to, where do I start? And for this part of the US economy, which is roughly half of US GDP, it's difficult because the big consultants of the world, whether it's a Bain Consulting, a McKinsey Consulting, PwC, pick a name, it's very hard for those big institutions to work with smaller companies because of just the economics and the scale. 
So you end up having this whole community, which we think of as the growth engine of America and in creating jobs and building innovation, that unless they're a hyper startup, right, unless you're trying to build the next Tesla or the next Google or something like that, there's lots of attention for that. But most businesses don't have the ability to become a trillion dollar company. That's just the reality, especially when you think about the services uh, aspect of the U.S. economy. And so the one thing that we have developed and we've trademarked as our collaborative ecosystem is actually to build the engine to help these businesses find acquisitions, find board members. So not just talk to them about here's what you should do. Here's what would be great for you, but actually help them be able to implement and execute. Because we found that if not, it was just too hard for them to do it standalone there weren't great access to service providers to do that. And so we decided to build that engine uh, within Star Mountain. And, and what we found in doing that over the past um, 13 years is that it really brings a differentiated value proposition for these business owners and, and they're willing to pay for it. And so part of alpha generating and investing, and as Bill pointed out, we can all have the best intentions in the world, but investors still want attractive risk adjusted returns. So if it doesn't translate into economic value, be a protection or higher return, it'll it'll likely face headwinds, let's just say. Uh, and what we've found is that business owners want to pay for these services. And when we think about the definition of alpha generating an excess return unrelated to risk, we really think a lot of our alpha is coming from labor, where there is a cost, and I think there's always a cost in life one way or another. In our case, it's the labor intensity uh, versus risk. And, and that's what we're built to address. So that's one way that we found that we can find a challenge that's systematic, develop something distinctive and generate uh, some alpha by creating a value proposition for business owners and investors that way. I don't know if Bill's back going, but maybe um, Scott, you want to maybe talk about sure. some opportunities you see? Yeah. So the premise upon um, uh, the, from my seat, wanting to see a deeper relationship where the government with public resources uh, understands the nature of Wall Street and Wall Street being uh, not just the investment banks, but the 50 trillion plus of investment dollars that's being allocated um, is my dad taught me a long time ago. Tell me where you sit and I'll tell you where you stand. And examples of that that I've seen, I spent a bunch of time in the Gulf when I was um, CEO Europe for Investcor. And uh, I met with uh, the sovereign wealth funds and many of the um, uh, very high net worth individuals who are looking to allocate capital. Uh, they've been large participants in um, alternate uses of energy. And I don't believe that it's necessarily because of altruism, rather it's a smart way to diversify their very concentrated position um, uh, in oil. Uh, analogously, I think um, the advent of SPACs and parenthetically, I have a uh, $345 million SPAC with uh, my partner, um, Makar Mazar. And um, when you look back over the past, and, and, and SPACs over the past 12 months have gotten uh, uh, a very bad name and uh, are getting trashed in the, in the media. And some of it's justified, but some of it not so much. When you look at the people who were making investments in these pipes, these are all people who had, for the most part, previously been growth equity investors, but they didn't have the exposure to early stage investments. So the lion's share of the hundred X's in the portfolio were garnered by the Kleiner Perkins and Sequoias and other venture capitalists who backed Google and Facebook and um, Uber and all, all these other incredibly successful companies. And within the context of a diversified portfolio, the backing one or two of those leaders delivered great returns. So when SPACs came um, uh, as a viable alternative for a company to go public, all of those investors who had been on the sideline were thinking, wow, I can allocate a slice of my portfolio to an earlier investment. And half of the SPACs that combined were no revenue SPACs. So when the media is trashing 
all of these companies and the regulators are starting to say, wow, we've got to step in and preclude companies from issuing projections. They're, they're, they're not realizing that had those investments been with a venture capitalist, with limited partners, there wouldn't be any clamoring. You wouldn't be looking at a stock price every day. You'd get a quarterly report to see how the company's doing and that's it. But it's well understood that it's not going to have revenue for another three, four, five years. So um, that to me is a bit of a, a fabrication and lack of understanding as it relates to where those companies are in the maturation cycle relative to historical traditional way IPOs. Um, uh, but I think it'd be a disservice if the regulators did do that because they'd be choking off an additional source of capital um, and you want competitive tension flowing. And the whole premise of this conversation, particularly on the ESG side, from my perspective, was opening the aperture of capital sources as opposed to restricting them for the leaders of tomorrow. And if you if you starve them of capital, um, then they're not going to see the light of day and it will take slower for us to evolve to wherever it is we want to be. So I'll stop there. And Michael, maybe you want to take it from there. Sure. sure. Well, um, I uh, I share some of that sentiment. I, I think that uh, those financing mechanisms all have a great point. Obviously, I'm jaded by being in the technology area. And so if we if we do stretch Wall Street to include Sand Hill Road, you know, I would tell you that uh, it saw dramatic differences. You know, 20, I don't want to admit this, but 23 years ago, 24 years ago, I went around pitching, uh, you know, my first startup. And uh, and we were lucky enough eventually to get money from from great firms, you know, Bessemer and HIG and Austin Ventures and the like. But it was a cottage industry and, and it was a, you know, it, it was a very difficult process. You know, so I would say access to capital, you know, could be made, but you you had to work pretty hard to find it. And uh, today, things like the, the SPAC market, as you say, um, they really provide growth engines for a lot of opportunities and, and limiting them because of expectations or the fact that your horizon is actually three years, uh, to me, seems seems imprudent. Uh, but we, we also have to make sure that uh, that that they are that we do protect uh, individual investors uh, in retail. So so there's a real trade off there. But I, I think in net. Uh, access to capital for high growth, high tech ideas is, is obviously critical to the economy. And, and now we have to look at the, the global uh, environment and, and, and see where companies are being formed. Um, I, I find that uh, uh, your, your differentiation strategy is, uh, is uh, uh, very powerful. Um, in our case, you know, we tend to take these tech companies and it's a bit of the reverse. We, we don't necessarily go in and and add ESG, um, but what will connect the tech company with resources in the public sector or with, with items in the beltway that are just very foreign to them, right? And that's where some magic can happen because you can unleash ESG opportunities. Um, we don't necessarily have to educate them. They all, they come to us already wanting to be the next, you know, the next SpaceX, right? So uh, I think uh, Elon Musk has done us all a great favor. He has created an example of an aspirational mission that was always done by something involving the government. It was, it was almost too aspirational to be a private sector company, uh, and he's made it happen. And, and I think the floodgates now are open and the challenge is out for other people. But we find innovators, talent, everyone's seeking that sense of mission. And so a lot of the times we're, we're just trying to marry that sense of mission to the right access points within the beltway that can really amplify it. And again, it's, it's back to what you said earlier. We need this alignment between government uh, and private sector, not overbearing industrial policy, um, but enough to uh, to keep Western democracies economically strong, um, to have their supply lines and supply chains all under you know their own control, and uh, and consequently have a more robust economy. I'll add to the uh, maybe I'll give an example of uh, something the government I think does do a, a good job of um, just where we're. Uh, you know, add, adding some balance, and uh, I'm certainly not perfect, um, and, and you know, I'm sure all of us agree with that. But it's also good to I think, point out the things that, that are working. So here, here are a couple examples, and Star Mountain works within them. So there's two different programs. Um, one of them that's governed within the Small Business Administration or the SBA. I presume most people have heard about them recently uh, with paycheck, paycheck Protection Plan and different things like that. Uh, where I think that they worked very aggressively to stimulate 
the economy and save jobs and so forth in the U.S. I think the U.S. really drove a lot of that leadership that helped other countries follow suit that I think made a dramatic impact in the economy we look at today versus I think what the economy could have looked like were it to have been a fear-driven economy. Um, the program, to, there's two programs Star Mountain works with within the government that I think are quite constructive partnerships. And of course, everything has its challenges that you have to work through and so forth. But one of them is the small business investment company program within the SBA, where the government helps provide uh, attractive leverage capital and creates a structure that allows commercial banks also to invest, having Volcker rule exemption and some other um, impact, I'll call them, type of credits that commercial banks can get to create uh, quite an effective public-private partnership to help get capital to high-quality, growing businesses that can drive innovation, job creation, and so forth. So that's uh, quite a great program that, that the SBA has been running now since, I think, 1958. Uh, and the second one that Star Mountain participates in with the government that I think is a good partnership is the business development company program they have where they have created, as, as you mentioned, um, both uh, Bill and Michael, not inhibiting capital flow, but allowing for it, yet protecting investors and having the right governance, the right regulation in place. I think the BDC is a good example of that under within the 40 act structure the different regulatory environments so we have to have a completely independent board of directors on top of our standard funds and investment committees and so forth and limited partnership boards so there's extra governance um, and extra work that goes into it but that allows for a different type of investor group to be able to invest and create that open market as as bill referenced but also as michael referenced to make sure there's the right protections in place to assist investors and protecting investors against things. So I think there's there's good learnings that uh, hopefully the government can draw upon um, and programs. I think the U.S. has done a great job with and, and having grown up in, in Canada and spending a lot of time in Europe in my earlier years as well, now living in the U.S. for about 20 years, you really see the capital markets part of the U.S. economy and how that is a really a uh, competitive advantage that the U.S. has that helps systematically foster innovation. You know, Bill reference the number of financial institutions if you look at the number of companies and the innovation that continues to happen in the u.s um, i think a big part of it is because of the capital market system and as you said michael people like elon musk they're willing to get out there and willing to get after it and the fact that there are different structures for investors and capital that's willing to look for different type of risk reward makes people be willing to have the courage to take the risks to think to dream uh, obviously, many of them won't succeed that way, but that really does drive innovation. And, and I, 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 you know, hope and think that the government can see that and understand how that really is important. Because if if capital flows stop, why why would people bother having all these dreams and thinking of things and trying to spin out and taking the risk to do them? And I hope with taxation that the government recognizes this as well. Uh, I don't want to go on too much of a tangent around that. But when you think about the risks that a lot of business owners take, how low of a probability success realistically is, it's not what you read about in Wall Street Journal, right? <laughs> Nobody talks about their failures. But if any of us that have studied data know that your probability of failing within a startup is somewhere in the high 90s, you know, it's, it's dramatic. And so if you take away the dynamic where that can be a long-term capital gain for business owners and for investors uh, in part of it, I think that... That can be restructured capital gains, but I do hope the government thinks about that because there's a real different risk threshold that entrepreneurs often will take and investors and in small investment funds, they're willing to invest in these small businesses as well that I think is an important part of innovation in an ecosystem. And one of the things I always hate seeing in politics is when people try to use politics and, and use something as an excuse to try to win instead of saying, look, let's come up with what the right solution is, right? What, what, you know, usually there's merit to all stories. What's a solution that, that actually marries things together properly. But I thought those couple uh, public private partnerships that the U S government does were, were worth calling out because I hope that the U S looks at them for future as they think about SPACs and other and say, how do we allow this to happen, but have the right regulatory investor protection framework. 
totally agree. One thing I'd add is um, broadening. Uh, we, we, we've talked about uh, government and industry partnerships, and we've talked about uh, the environment, but broadening it uh, to include not-for-profits and NGOs, I think a lot of times um, uh, I mean, there are too few uh, that engage with industry and collaborate with industry in a way that they come up with a better economic mousetrap for industry that happens to correlate to um, the NGO or the not-for-profit's agenda. Uh, there is a bucket of money, which is philanthropy. And I think um, most, most corporations have buckets of philanthropy, and that's a good thing. That being said, across the universe of things that um, I think many of us would agree are good for our country, good for the world, good for corporations, uh, we're not seeing the acceleration. And I think part of that is because there's, uh, at all levels, while there's the good work, there could be better um, uh, cooperation. I'll give a couple examples in the diversity inclusion front. Um, 15 years ago, when um, uh, HR was under my uh, remit as CAO of one of the largest uh, firms on Wall Street, I created a partnership with Spelman College, which is a historically black college and university uh, outside of Atlanta. It's all women and Wall Street. Um, up to then, I had already doubled the number of African-Americans who were uh, in Lehman Brothers in the halls of uh, wealth and power creation would be investment banking, capital markets and investment management division. And but I wanted to do a lot more. So one of the things I did was I created this partnership. And I gave all of the vice presidents one as a mentee and said that I was taking 10 percent of their bonus away from them. And I didn't care if they came to Lehman Brothers. What I cared was that they ended up in a great job. And uh, I didn't do that 100 percent purely because I thought it was just the right thing to do, although I did think it was the right thing to do, um, in part is because I wanted to brand our firm as the place where every person could achieve their potential because every person was going to get opportunity and no other firm on wall street did that there was another group that called sponsors sponsored educational opportunities that funneled um uh predominantly black college and university students to wall street and uh, most of the wall street firms participated uh, in a more economic way than a not-for-profit would necessarily want to speak, um, what I did is uh, I made sure that I gave twice as much as everybody else because I knew that by doing that, I was going to get the best talent. And oh, by the way, it was less expensive than the fully loaded cost of going to Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and all these other institutions. So I was able to radically change the demographics of the entry level class and at the same time improve the caliber of students at a lower cost. So what I'd like to see out of, as we talked about, as it relates to the investment community, NGOs and not-for-profits, more collaboration to get inside the thinking of the mission of companies, because I think we have so much more wood to chop, positive wood to chop across having corporate America be better stakeholders than where we are today if we do that. You know, it's, it's Scott, I think uh, you, that's great, uh, a great story. And in particular, it highlights how powerful it is when we end up doing the right thing for the right reasons. And so when we do look at uh, what, uh, what it means uh, to pursue diversity, to pursue uh, the right climate change position, uh, to do even pursue a certain amount of, uh, of uh, again, the, uh, um, concern for the for the Western democracies and, and their security, um, you end up benefiting, you end up economically benefiting, uh, you end up sourcing better talent. It's very different than government mandates that force something uh, because, you know, it's all about the intention with which we do things. And so I, I think you're as a leader, then your your employees see that they can sense that you're doing this for the right reasons, and then they they all start to to employ uh, the neurocircuitry that does reward us when we actually do the right thing and we help others. So so there's there's a you know there's a, a real uh, a, a real phenomena there. Uh, I find it to be economically beneficial for us to again have this sense of mission 
simply from a, a, a sourcing of talent. You know, as you know, tech talent right now is nearly impossible to hire. Um, we are giving, as you mentioned, uh, Goldman, Brett, uh, 30% raises. That, that's about the average raise in Austin, Texas, uh, for a developer with three years of experience, right? <laughs> because uh, I will lose her if I don't. So, uh, so we're, we're, you know, we're definitely in, in a race. And one of the key differentiators is what does your company need? What does it stand for? And for example, I, at uh, Ideal Semiconductor is one where if you asked me uh, 15 years ago, we did a, a company with a similar power efficiency chip. And, you know, the big deal was that it was in the iPhone and that attracted employees. That's not how it works today. What they care about with Ideal Semiconductor is that, you know, this chip causes you to burn X percent less energy in your electric vehicle and in all those servers running all that stuff we like to use today. And and that is the call from which we, we recruit. Um, so I... I, I think that there's an organic movement in that way that goes even beyond the government pushing it, uh, but it does require that kind of alignment. Bill, uh, I know we're ending here shortly. Not sure if you're uh, back on any any last uh, things or you want us to know, just take, keep yeah. taking a crack at it. I'm not sure when <laughs> when they, they officially pull us, uh, pull us off here, but yeah, I think um, four minutes, I think, uh, you know, uh, Bill, far, far ahead of your time, obviously, with your innovative approaches to hiring. And, and as as uh, I think Michael calls out as well, I think the best businesses have to think that way and leadership has to think that way and say, where is the best talent? How do we build that talent diversity, not only by, you know, sex and skin color, but by thought and by backgrounds and growing up and if you look at a lot of, I grew up in a very small town of 10,000 people in the middle of nowhere, north, northwestern Canada, and you know there are a lot of people in middle America that are not recruited on, as as Bill pointed out. Um, so there, I think there's a lot of opportunity there for talent. Is the way I kind of position is that look, if you can go to environments and find driven, hardworking people, uh, I may be wrong, but what I've seen in data and what I've seen from our own experience in, in private investing for over 20 years is that there are driven high quality people everywhere. Ivy leagues, non Ivy leagues, big cities, small cities. And if you can find that driven, passionate talent, there's often some great uh, value to create for businesses there. And then if you can bring the mission of what you're doing as Michael does as well into showing the impact on what you're doing. So for us, for example, at Thin Star Mountain Capital, we're not just showing the returns where we share the profits of our investing with 100% of our team, inclusive of executive assistants and so forth. So everybody's in the mission and aligned together, but also showing the impact. What is it doing to jobs? What's it doing to communities? How is this formidably impacting people's lives and how is it impacting communities? So people really understand the cause effect of what they're doing and and. And we find that that's incredibly valuable. And we're trying to actually build more and more dashboards and more data around that to really bring that to light. And in fact, our pub, some of the private public partnerships we have with U.S. government entities require us to be tracking and showcasing some of that data, which has been a nice nudge. And, and we see it uh, with big institutional investors, as Bill was discussing at the beginning, that they actually want to see that data as well. So we love and embrace that because that's always been part of our business model. So we're actually happy because it makes it easier for us to showcase uh, as a little closing remark from me. Um, I'd close uh, by saying that um, I think part of it is uh, important for us to all celebrate those, uh, those moments where you have a great intersection of doing the right thing, making the world a better place um, uh, and addressing the specific constituents um, business needs. Uh, and there are lots of industries. We happen to be one where uh, we're all investors. Um, uh, on putting people to work, one of the things that I did recently was saw that war for talents. At the same time, the mobility issue. And um, uh, I worked with a and Capital and put together um, a roll-up of IT staffing and solutions uh, companies so that they could grow the impact of how many people they put to work. And we've put tens of thousands of people to work. And at the same time, in a 24 month period, uh, we achieved a th close to three and a half times a multiple invested capital over 100% return. 
uh, in so doing. So there's lots of intersection of doing the right thing um, um, and making the world a better place. 20 years ago, um, uh, the Wall Street firm where I was was um, was getting crushed on the campuses of the Ivy League schools by uh, Goldman Sachs and uh, Morgan Stanley. So one of the things that I put together was a thing called targeted recruiting, where, and now I'm picking up on uh, the point that you just made, Brett, um, you don't have to just go to Ivy League schools. So rather, uh, and this is an idea that any company can adopt right now, and in my conversations, companies aren't really doing this. Um, and they're still in the legacy days of showing up at whatever number of campuses they think uh, they need to fill their incoming classes. But what you can do is identify from the leadership of your company, what are the markers for success? In the case of Wall Street, a lot of times that's leadership positions accompanying with um, strong academic performance. And student athletes were one of those buckets. So I specifically targeted academic All-Americans, academic All-Ivy, academic All-Big Ten and Pac-10. And uh, in the first pilot, we, we, we hired five academic All-Americans. Um, believe it or not, I happened to send Drew Brees a letter. He said, no, good for him. Um, but we ended up in three years hiring half of the 1,500 entry-level analysts through this program away from those traditional halls. And they ended up doing better. So leveraging technology is another way we haven't really talked a lot about it, where you can really make a difference and make sure that you deliver opportunity for all. And that would certainly be a contributing factor towards driving your business um, and doing another thing that would be good for uh, the country. Uh, well, look, I, I think uh, we're, we're pretty much done. I just want to say it's a pleasure to be on with such uh, experienced uh, and expert panelists. So I've enjoyed that. And, uh, you know, I, I would only say that uh, uh, I'm, I'm just glad uh, to see the direction that, uh, that we're, we're now pursuing with a lot of businesses having, again, mission, purpose, but also profit. And uh, again, that's something 20 years ago was kind of difficult. I, I used to explain to VCs and apologize why my one software company had recurring government revenue today that's you know celebrated and people want to know how you can expand it uh so i i think that uh you know andreessen horowitz coined it the best of course because they're such brilliant marketers uh with um american dynamism as a, a new investment practice but i think there's a, a a new trend where you can align yourself uh with the right with the right directions to rebuild trust in our institutions, uh, to to build the workforce that will that will be most equitable and uh, and productive, and uh, and then also to uh, you know to keep our economy dynamic. So thank you. Great to be with you, gentlemen. Thank you. Take great care. weekend, everybody.